Hi, my name is Kristen Watson. I'm an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy and a member of the Atrium Cardiology Collaborative. Welcome to our first Cardiology Trial Rewind presentation, which will focus on the use of clopidogrel in practice. We will be embracing Throwback Thursday in a unique way each week. We will be posting a YouTube video, blog, or tweeting about landmark clinical trials or a trial which has set the stage for our current practice. We will be posting these on Twitter using the hashtag CVTrialTBT. So be sure to follow us on HMRX to see our new post each week. So as I mentioned, our first program is going to focus on the use of clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is a thionylpyridine and exerts exact, exact, its action by inhibiting ADP or adenosine diphosphate from binding to the P2Y12 receptor on the platelet. By doing this, further platelet aggregation is prevented. Clopidogrel exerts a non-reversible effect and its effects last the life of the platelet. Prior to the use of clopidogrel, really the standards of care is antiplatelet therapy or aspirin and ticlopidine therapy. Limitations with aspirin include the risk of gastrointestinal hemorrhage as well as the risk for gastrointestinal intolerances such as nausea and vomiting. Ticlopidine is also listed in its adverse effect profile due to bone marrow suppression and also intolerability such as diarrhea. So clopidogrel with a similar mechanism of action to ticlopidine was developed with a, a more favorable side effect profile. So the first trial we are going to discuss is the Capri trial. The Com Capri trial was a clopidogrel versus aspirin in patients at risk for ischemic events trial. And the, in this study, patients were randomized to clopidogrel 75 milligrams or aspirin 325 milligrams per day. And it enrolled patients with atherosclerotic vascular disease. So these are patients with a myocardial infarction that occurred within the prior 35 days. Those with a recent stroke, so that stroke had to happen more than a week ago, but less than six months ago, or symptomatic peripheral arterial disease, or PAD. Those with PAD can, could also be included if they had symptomatic disease in the past, which requ which re Required amputation or revascularization. revascularization. Notable exclusion criteria were those who were less than the age of 21, had high risk features for bleeding, or severe hepatic or renal impairment. There were over 19,000 patients enrolled in the study, and this provided over 36,000 patient years at risk data to be analyzed. As you can see here, the primary outcome was the risk of ischemic stroke, myocardial infarction, or vascular death. The event rate was significantly lower in the clopidogrel group at 5.32% versus 5.83% with aspirin therapy, conferring a relative risk reduction of 8.7%. Side effects were similar between the two groups, including all bleeding, with the exception of gastrointestinal hemorrhage, which was higher in the aspirin group and this was expected. Also, nausea, vomiting, and indigestion were higher in the aspirin group. The side effect that was more common in the clopidogrel group, though, was rash. Breaking the results down further, looking at the subgroups based on the indication for which they were enrolled, either stroke, MI, or peripheral arterial disease, or PAD. As you can see here in the representations on the slide, the event rate with those with stroke or myocardial infarction were not different in patients who received clopidogrel or placebo. However, you can see that there was a significant difference in the event rate in those with peripheral arterial disease or PAD who received clopidogrel. There was a t over a 23% relative risk reduction in that group. This difference in those with peripheral arterial disease is really what drove the overall benefit with clopidogrel in the overall results of this study. I think it should be taken with a grain of salt that clopidogrel does look more favorable in those with peripheral arterial disease in this study, as the study, the study was not powered to detect that difference with between subgroups. 
In follow-up studies, such as the Charisma study, which looked at the combination of clopidogrel and aspirin therapy in patients with high-risk features, the combination of aspirin and clopidogrel did not show any benefit over aspirin alone in this PAD subgroup. So I think we should take that to consider that more potent antiplatelet therapy does not necessarily translate into improved outcomes in this subgroup of patients. I do think though for all subgroups here, those with stroke, myocardial infarction, or peripheral arterial disease, if aspirin therapy is indicated but cannot be tolerated due to side effects or due to other intolerances that, such as allergies, that clopidogrel would be a suitable alternative for this patient population. So now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the use of clopidogrel in acute coronary syndromes. I think probably the most quoted study of clo regarding clopidogrel that I hear used in practice is, are the results of the CURE trial. The CURE trial was the clopidogrel in unstable angina to prevent recurrent events trial. This trial enrolled patients with non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome presenting within 24 hours of symptoms. So this included patients with non-ST segment elevation MI or unstable angina. The majority of these patients, about 75%, presented due to the indication of unstable angina. And the rationale for this study was that up until this time, it was well known that the use of short-term dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and ticlopidine or even aspirin and clopidogrel was associated with a reduction in events following percutaneous transluminal angiography, angioplasty with stent placement. But what was not known is the combination, therapy, combination dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and an agent such as clopidogrel in the long term would reduce outcomes. So notable exclusion criteria in this study were those with elevated bleeding risk, severe heart failure, or those receiving oral anticoagulants. Patients were randomized to receive a 300 milligram loading dose of clopidogrel followed by 75 milligrams per day versus placebo. All patients in the study received aspirin at a dose of 75 to 325 milligrams per day. Then aspirin dose was dictated by the site or the prescriber. Patients received therapy for three to, my, to 12 months with the median duration of therapy being nine months. The primary outcome was cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI or stroke. And you can see here there's a 20% relative risk, a relative risk decrease in those patients who were randomized to clopidogrel versus placebo therapy. There was also a significant reduction in the risk of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, stroke, or recurrent ischemia. When looking at the cumulative hazard ratio presented on the y-axis, and over time, that risk of death from cardiovascular causes non-fatal MI or stroke, so looking at time across the x-axis, you can see that at three months, we could see a difference. You can start to see, and even a little bit earlier, the, diff the lower risk of events in those with clopidogrel therapy. And you can see that that difference in event rate stayed over time. So let's look a little bit further at the results of the CURE trial. As we mentioned previously, the reduction in outcomes were significantly lower with clopidogrel paired compared to placebo. But looking, let's look at the difference in the rate of adverse reactions, primarily looking at the difference in the rate of bleeding. So just as a reminder, TME major bleeding is defined as any intracranial hemorrhage or clinical, clinical overt signs of, he of hemorrhage associated with a five gram per deciliter or more drop in hemoglobin or fatal bleeding. The authors also used the gusto criteria of life-threatening bleeding. And you can see there was a difference, a significantly higher rate of TME major bleeding in the clopidogrel group, but the, but the risk of gusto life-threatening bleeding was not different between the two treatment arms. The results of this trial really led to the routine use of clopidogrel in combination with aspirin following an, a non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome and that with therapy being 
anywhere from about nine to 12 months. One thing that's very important to remember from the results of the CURE trial is only about over six, only about 60% or so of patients underwent, um, coroner, underwent coronary stenting. So this data provides us with information that this combination of clopidogrel and aspirin therapy is beneficial in those who are being medically managed. As mentioned, 36% in, of patients enrolled in the CURE trial underwent revascularization. So the PCI CURE trial was a subset of the CURE trial to look at those patients who underwent percutaneous coronary intervention with the intent to determine if the pretreatment with clopidogrel and aspirin was superior to aspirin alone to those patients in redu reducing subsequent ischemic events. Patients who were in Patients enrolled received study treatment for a median of six days prior to undergoing PCI. And some of you may be thinking, that's not what standard of care is at this time, and that is true, but this was standard of care of practice back in the time in which the study was conducted. Those patients who, were in, who did undergo PCI, they did, after PCI therapy, they did receive open-label thionopyridine therapy for two to four weeks because that was standard of care at that time. The study medication was then resumed after that two to four week period until the end of follow-up, which was a median of eight months. So the PCI cure trial, those patients, they received when they were enrolled a loading dose of clopidogrel plus 75 milligrams per day or placebo. Again, all patients received aspirin therapy. Then a group of patients underwent percutaneous coronary intervention and of those patients receive therapy for about six days prior to that intervention. So the, in this group, we look at the event rates both at 30 days and at that end of the trial period. So you can see that there, again, was a significant reduction in the event rate of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, or revascularization in those who were randomized to clopidogrel versus placebo therapy. This significant difference was both seen at the 30-day mark as well as the end of the trial period. So again, we saw those effects early on and persisted to the end of the trial, and that's similar to what we saw in the, cure, the overall CURE trial results. Timmy major bleeding was not different between the two groups, both at that 30-day mark at the end of the trial period, nor was gusto life-threatening bleeding between the two groups. In looking at us, a subs, look, looking at this data further, and these results were published in the European Heart Journal in 2008, they looked to see if the difference in major bleeding what, uh, and bleeding overall was affected by the dose of aspirin therapy. And what was found in that sub-study is that use of low-dose aspirin, so less than or equal to 100 milligrams, was same effectiveness with less bleeding as compared to high-dose aspirin over 200 milligrams per day. And that was one of the, some of the results that really led to changes in practice over time with us steering with that high-dose aspirin and moving towards low-dose aspirin in combination therapy with dual antiplatelet, with an alternative antiplatelet therapy. Data from the CURE and PCI CURE, as well as other studies, showed the ben demonstrated the benefit of dual antiplatelet therapy in patients presenting with a non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome. But there's really limited data surrounding the use of dual antiplatelet therapy in the acute MI setting. So thus the COMMIT and CCS2 trial was conducted. The patients enrolled in the study presented within 24 hours of their suspected acute car myocardial infarction and of those enrolled, 93% either had an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or a left bundle branch block. Patients in the study did not receive a clopidogrel loading dose as we're used to in standard of practice at this time and in the CURE study, but they were initiated, initiated on clopidogrel 75 milligrams per day or placebo. All patients did receive aspirin therapy at 162 milligrams per day. Patients received therapy until hospital discharge or four weeks during hospitalization. And this worked out to be about a mean duration of therapy of 14 days in patients in either of the two treatment groups. 
The mean age of participants was 61 years old and 72% of patients were male. 54% of patients enrolled in the study received lytic therapy. Patients were not to be enrolled in the study if they were undergoing primary percutaneous coronary intervention because as we know, standard of care in that patient population was the combination of, clo- of a therapy such as clopidogrel in combination with aspirin therapy. There were two primary endpoints here, the first being death, reinfarction, or stroke. This was significantly reduced with clopidogrel therapy with an event rate of 9.2% with clopidogrel versus slightly over 10% with placebo. Death from any cause, again, was significantly lower with clopidogrel therapy compared to those receiving placebo. One of the things that the investigators looked at in this study is when was the benefit of clopidogrel seen? Again, I remind you that patients in this study did not receive a loading dose of clopidogrel. But you can see data represented in two different ways here on the, on the slide shows the, the event rate um, of the event rate for patients. So breaking it down at day zero, one, two to three, four to seven, and then longer out to days eight to 28. As you can see, really that difference in the event rate, the difference in events occurred very early on, and that's really what drove the difference to show clopidogrel was more effective in this population. And this difference in events was really driven by a significant reduction in the rate of death between that, the, fir- the day of enrollment and that the first day of therapy. So this study, again, demonstrated the benefit of early dual antiplatelet therapy and that the benefits are seen early on. In the absence of contraindications in patients who are presenting with ST segment elevation MI or left bundle branch block would benefit from clopidogrel or placebo therapy. Again, recall that this study was not looking at when we look at our patients who present with ST segment elevation in practice, it, we typically, they are typically undergoing um, percutaneous coronary intervention in most patient care settings. This study did not look at that. This study was looking at those patients who did not undergo that primary uh, percutaneous coronary intervention for their acute myocardial infarction. So just a few more tidbits on clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is contraindicated in patients with active pathological bleed or they have a hypersensitivity to clopidogrel. Drug interactions include 2C19 inhibitors such as omeprazole and esomeprazole. It's important to remember that before prescribing or recommending a PPI to a patient with clopidogrel that we determine if there is a real indication um, for use as we should be doing with all of our PPI inhibitors. Again, adverse reactions in addition to bleeding include a hypersensitivity reaction. These are rare but can occur. Um, And TTP can also occur. Clopidogrel is a category B pregnancy and use is not recommended in breastfeeding. We hope you enjoyed our first Throwback Thursday program and look for, look, we look forward to sharing more of these with you. 